Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's working. Last week we had some issues. Well, last time I was here, we had some issues with our microphone. So we're trying a different one. Hopefully that will go fine. Today we would like to encourage, hopefully, and stress the importance of the choices that we make. Um, it's a good group. Missing some faces yet, but I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here. The topic today is a story that you know fairly well, and I hope that you'll be able to go away understanding that we have a God who is magnificent and who loves us and he's able to take care of us. That's what I want us to remember. Before we start, though, I need God's help, so let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again for this time. Hide this piece of clay and speak to your people. We need your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Orville said hello, so I want to say hi to my mom. Let she forget that I think she's not out there, but she said, I will watch you tomorrow. So I talked to her yesterday. So she's watching her son. Courage. What is courage? Courage is a quality that was demonstrated in the life of Christ. Courage is a quality that every Christian needs to exhibit, sometimes more so than others. Dictionary defines courage as mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. We celebrate courage when we have soldiers who go through crisis times. Desmond Dawes was one of our members years ago who single-handedly saved 70, 75 men in the heat of battle over there in, I think it was Hiroshima. He got a wound, but he trusted God to take care of him. And because of his courage, 75, 75 men thereabouts were able to say, thank God I'm still alive. Amen. We're in a time in the world when we're going to be called upon to exhibit courage. The Bible lists among those who will be left outside in of the new Jerusalem and Jesus comes as those that are cowards. So we don't want to be a coward, we want to be a courageous Christian for Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Bible has many stories that talk about courage. We're going to refer to one today because the clock is going to chase me again. So I just took one. But I want to look at some things. Courage is usually demonstrated in an environment where fear is magnified. When you're on a battlefield and there's bullets flying across you or bombs going off around you, there is a fear factor. Amen? In the Christian life, we have many things that generate fear in our hearts. We happen to be living in a time when the Bible said in the last days men's hearts will be failing them for fear. And our world is afraid today. And because of fear they do, people do strange things and weird things and sometimes good and bad things in fear. Because of fear. Sometimes there are other motives. But what are some things that generate fear? Well let's look at some of the things that are described our day today. The fantastic store of 
destructive power in the stockpiles of nuclear bomb and intercontinental ballistic missiles have created a state of despondent fear and desperate worry in the hearts of many people today. You hear on the news about you know, Iran, if Iran gets nuclear power, what they're going to do? You look at what they've done without that. What would they do with that? Should we worry about that? I don't, because, as he said, God is in charge. I don't believe the world is going to be blown up to conclude its end. Jesus will come and end it all. And for those who have been courageous in living for him, we will have the privilege of accompanying him back to a world that we have no, imagine, no imagination of how wonderful and good it is. But other things that generate fear, hunger surges, scourges, pardon me, the whole population. I drive around sometimes visiting people or going for Bible studies or other errands that I may have to run. And on a regular basis, almost without exception, I come to somebody on some corner saying, with a sign, I'm hungry. Help, please. Anything will help. If I have, I give and share. If I don't have, I say, Lord, that's not your desire for this country. It's not your desire for that person. Help them, please. Social disorders. Strife and racial uprisings constitute further proof that apprehension dominates our society. I just read in the media this week, and I don't get time to go through the news as far as television here and sit down and watch the news every day. I try to glean what I can over different, excuse me, different uh, venues or different sources. What's happening in our world? They tell me in Chicago, not Chicago, yeah, in Chicago there was a problem in Seattle, there's a problem. They're having in different cities and different places. People are afraid because the police have been cut back in some areas. Crime is on the rise. I read some place where the up, statistically speaking, in this particular community, it had increased 30 percent over last year. That's significant. People are afraid that they're walking down the street, somebody's going to bother me. In our universities, it used to be a quiet place where you went to study. You found a quiet place. You opened your books or you went to the library. You did your research and that was it. You got your education. You went on your way. You sit down and discuss with your friends, but not so today. In many of the universities today, there's this group against that group. Sometimes there's violence involved, there are protests involved. People are afraid. It takes a brave person, a courageous person, to go out and say, I am a Christian. I live for Jesus. What happens? Do we do that? Sometimes it's difficult to live for Jesus in our own, in our own families. You see, I believe that many people today are not here because someone who maybe, not necessarily in this group, but someone who went to church did not live like Jesus did and discouraged that person from coming. But I'm told that before Jesus comes, there's going to be a resurgence of the love of God among his people. And as we used to sing a song in Mexico when I was there in Stu, Senor, uh, I'm about to change it, put it in English. Dear Lord, send us a revival and let it begin with me. So I need to be what I expect you to be. That's, that was my philosophy when I was teaching school. My prayer every morning was, Lord, please help me to be what I want my students to become. Amen. And that's not an easy prayer to follow. We need God's help. We need to recognize that without Jesus, he said, without me, you can do nothing. 
Other issues that cause fear and is causing fear in our communities, delinquency is increasing in such an alarming extent that worried authorities can't control it. They don't know what to do. Troubled parents who may be at times deprived of some family member. You know, I was just reading an article this week where a mother was reading her Bible to her child and was killed by a stray bullet. Wasn't involved. She was doing what she understood God wanted her to do, teaching her child about Jesus and died because of somebody else's misbehavior. So we're living in an insure world. We have to be in walking with Jesus, folks, like we have never walked with Him before. But that only can happen when we really believe what the Bible says. Now many people know what the Bible says, but they don't believe it. How do I say that? Because they don't practice it. Our lesson this week, Sabbath school lesson, those of you who were here, you learned that God said to Israel, you're about to go home. You're about to inherit the land that I promised your forefathers. You did what I said, that's why you're here. Now you're going into Canaan. Please do what I say. And it'll go well with you. But there are those who come to church sometimes. And their idea is, I went to church, therefore I'm fine. When I go home, I'll do what I like. Folks, I want to tell you, that's not a Christian. So we need to be courageous for God. And one of the other issues, and I'm going to go on to the next part of this here. Another indisputable problem or a symptom of our troubled society, is a growing number of suicides. And the alarming figures on mental illness and psychic disorders. They tell me, again, as you look at the statistical information, suicides are up in some groups almost 50% over the last year or two. And very high among our young people. Why? Could it be because those young people don't see in their parents, in their older family members, in their church relatives or uh, church family, they don't see a reflection of the love that Jesus has for them? I'm asking a lot of questions today because part of it, I want you to think. I don't want you to come to church and say, oh, the pastor preached a wonderful sermon and then go home and forget it. We need to analyze ourselves. Am I that courageous Christian for Christ? Am I living as Jesus would live in my place right now in my circumstance? That must be the question that we answer positively Every day, all day long. Amen. You can't live tomorrow. I visited this week, I mentioned this morning, I visited this week with a gentleman who called a few days ago. I had been trying to catch up with him for a while. Never could. At the request of a relative. And he, my phone rang and it says, it's a Tucson number, so usually if it's a Tucson number, I generally try and answer it because I get it from all over the country sometimes. Just want to sell you something. Once in a while, somebody from Tucson as well. But I answered the phone and he says, uh, Pastor Simmons, yes. I'm so and so. Okay, good to catch up with you. Can I talk to you? Sure. Can we meet? Of course. Where do you live? Give me your address. I will come and see you. Set a time. Give a date. And I got up and I drove across town. Stays on each side. And I had a call a few minutes early because I was delayed a few minutes. And so if I have an appointment at 10 
and I know I'm not going to be there by 10 on the money, I will call ahead and say, I'm on my way, but I'm going to be five, 10 minutes late. So I did, and he answered the phone. When I got there, he was waiting outside for me. Come to my little place, and we went and we visited for a while. This young man grew up in the church. Older man now. But something happened in church that caused him to go the other way. Had a hard life, what I understand from his story. In and out of the hospital, with problems. But the Holy Spirit is wonderful and God is wonderful to us. Because he's now saying, but I have to come back. I want to go and visit. I'll visit again. But I want to know how to be victorious. He says, you know, it's hard. You're living in an environment where you smell drugs that way and you hear people drinking that way. And that was your problem. It's, it is difficult. I said, but it is, this is how you have to do it. This, in my mind, is a secret to successful Christian living. Just live for Jesus today. Just today. We only live today. Yesterday, I can't change. It's gone. Tomorrow is not here. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Live for me today. And he said, you know, I never heard that before. And we don't have to explain, you know, if you will choose when you get up. Lord, you take my life and run it today. And there comes a problem along the way. And you can say, Lord, you ask, please ask, help me today. Just right now, not to do what I'm not supposed to do. And help me to do it your way. And he will get you through today. Period. But you've got to be courageous. And choose to say, I don't mind what happens. I'm going to do it God's way. That was the story of these three boys. Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo. They grew up as young men. In... Their homes in Jerusalem. The king at the time and the people of Israel were not doing what God said. And so God allowed the heathen Nebuchadnezzar to go to visit with them. And he took, destroyed Jerusalem and took all the wise, smart, intelligent, good looking young men in particular. To take them back to Babylon and then expand his kingdom. He sent them to the best school, University of Babylon. And because they practiced God's principles in health, remember the story of Daniel and the meals? Sir, please don't allow us to defile ourselves with the king's meat. We will eat, eat, just eat vegetables and drink water. And he says, but I, I can't do that. But just try it for 10 days and you check it out for yourself. And in 10 days, God was able to demonstrate that his way is better than their way. But then they had to go to school and they graduated summa cum laude, the head of the class. And then he employed them in his ministry. He said, now you guys are trustworthy. You guys are honest. You guys are loyal. I'm going to give you charge of this and this and this. The Bible doesn't say what, but they were among the leadership of Babylon. Now the king had had his dream. He had his dream of metals. He couldn't understand and Daniel interpreted for him and he loved that part that said, you are the head of gold. It's amazing how if we don't consistently every day keep our focus on Jesus, we erode our relationship with him. Because Nebuchadnezzar, over time, being the proud man that he was, began to distance his ideology and his thinking about his subservience to and need to serve the God of the creation. 
and thinking about his future, the future of his kingdom, said, no, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to make me a, an image, and I'm going to make it all gold. Because remember the last part of the vision says, in the days of these kings, in the last, done in our time, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that is going to last forever. I'm going to make me an image all gold. That's going to represent the fact that I'm going to live, my kingdom is going to last forever. Later for that God. And so he built the image. And that was a lot of, go a lot of gold. Because the Bible dimension says it was 60 cubits, that's about 90 feet high. Six cubits, about nine feet wide. Now how thick? It doesn't say. But I would suspect that if you wanted proportionally made, as an image would have to have been, it was a lot of tons of gold. And when he completed it, he said, now I'm going to have everybody come and comment, demonstrate their commitment to me and my kingdom. So he called all the governors of all his provinces and his sad traps. And the Bible gives a list of all these different rulers, governors and mayors and different people in his kingdom. I want you all to come to the plain of Dura. And when the music plays, to show your obedience to me, your commitment to me, and your obedience to my gods, you're going to bow down and worship at the sound of the music. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among those of leadership. Therefore, they were obliged to show up. But we don't know what happened to Daniel. He was prime minister. Maybe he had some other errands to run. Well, he was removed because the king had no doubt about his commitment. We don't know. But well, they showed up according to orders. That they could do. But the music began to play and everybody went like a wave. And these guys stood up like sore thumbs. And the Babylonians, oh, we got them now. Because if they don't bow down, they're going to the furnace. King, you the story there in Daniel chapter 3. These young men that you, I'm going to rub it into the king, you know. These guys that you put in position, they aren't listening to you. They don't worship your gods. They're disloyal. Now, by rights, he should have just sent the army and bound them and sent them into the fire. But he didn't. He knew these guys. He wanted them not to have to die. So he sent for them, bring them to me. And his blood pressure was going up. So they came. And he says, now, gentlemen, He's never gets it in a rage, a fury. Bring them. And as they showed up, he said, now, gentlemen, you know, if you'll just bow down, or make it look like you're bowing down, you don't have to go to the fire. And then he made this pronouncement that was a big mistake, in my opinion, on his part. And who is this God who will deliver you from my hands? Here you find it. Here in verse 15. Read the whole verse. Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psalmstery, in symphony with the kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image in which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then the question that he goofed up on. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Don't mock God. Amen. 
An aside. Illustration, don't mock God. I read the story of a young lady, Christian background, had friends who were not necessarily Christians. They had decided that they're going to go joyriding. And so mother was told, she was, I'm going to go with my friends tonight. We don't know whose car was driving. One of them was driving his car. We take Billy's car. And it's Susie and Mary and Tom and me. So I said, okay, be careful, sis, my sweetheart, be careful. So as the car pulled up and she was about to get into the car, mother came out and says, now may God go with you. Now with five people in the car, the car was pretty well full, right? Three in the back, two in the front. And she made this mocking remark. If God's going to go with us, he's got to ride in the trunk. And off they went. That night there was a serious accident. If I recall, one of them or a couple of them died. The car was pretty well totaled. Now how on earth there was a dozen eggs in the trunk, I don't know. But they opened the trunk and there was a dozen eggs and every egg was intact. Don't mock God. Nebuchadnezzar says to Shadrach, Meshach, now they're responding now to him. Who's going to deliver you? I love the response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, what you just said. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But now I like the last part best. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor do we worship the golden image which you have set up. Amen. They had come to know Jesus as their friend. They had come to know Christ as the one who could do anything needed to save his people. Amen. And they acted like they believed it. Do we? And so, you know the story. It says, Nebuchadnezzar blew a gasket. And he says, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed. Because towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind them as they were. With their hat, their coat, bind them up, tie them up, and throw them into the furnace. Now, I, I, I like the next part of the story. He mocked God. He's now angry because they're saying, my God's bigger than you. And these guys are saying, we don't know what's going to happen, Lord, but we know you're able. But we're going to trust you anyhow. They were courageous young men. And you know the story. They threw them in. And the fire was hot. Because the Bible says that those soldiers were killed by the fire. It was hot. And he's waiting for the smoke to go up and them to disappear. And lo and behold, he looks. Hey, wait a minute. 
And he says, now nah, maybe I'm seeing things. Hey guys, did we put three or four guys in there? Three, sir. But I see four. I love this part because it tells me Jesus never abandons his faithful children. Never. But for us to experience his intervention in our lives, we must obey. That's it. Four, not three. Now I tell people, you know, I like this story because it tells me that when Jesus is in my presence, or I'm in his presence, better said, nothing can hurt me. And when he air conditions a super hot fire, it doesn't even burn me. Nothing that men can do to me is possible unless God allows it. I'm saying that, Father, because we're going to face some things here in the near future where you're going to have to be courageous. I'm hearing all kinds of people around the country right now who are being courageous and saying, I can't take this vaccination. Whether it's good or bad. But they have a choice. And they say, I will exercise my choice not to do this to me. But there are the powers that be who say, no, you're going to do it or else. Some have been fired. Some have been put on leave with no pay. They still have a mortgage to pay. They still have gas to buy and food to provide for their families. But I praise the Lord that I've heard many people say, God will take care of me. So my question is, when we get to the place when it comes not to vaccines necessarily, but when they say you've got to keep Sunday. If you don't, we're going to cancel your account at the bank. I could spend a lot of time telling you a lot of data that I have come to learn that would probably blow some of your minds. I'm not going there. I want you to understand that we serve a God who's able to take care of his people. And those who are members of this church, Midville, you should be able to say with no questions in your minds, God has taken care of us. Amen. Has he not? Yes. Some have been sick with this COVID. But they aren't sick now. And we didn't lose any as far as I know. Of this group. God is able, but we need to be courageous. You know, going into Canaan, you find in Deuteronomy 31, 16, Moses makes these comments to the children of Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you, and He will not leave you nor forsake you. Brethren, we're about to go on our journey to heaven. And the more intense it gets, the more we should be praising God and pressing together, praying for each other, encouraging each other, because we're going home soon. Amen. And God is not going to abandon us. He promised. He always keeps His promise. And so we didn't miss it in Deuteronomy. He told the same thing to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 verse 7. Only God speaking through the prophet maybe or inspiration. He says, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded to you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. God speaking through Joshua to the children of Israel. That message is for us. But the part we must remember is this part where it says that you observe 
to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn this way or that way. Follow Jesus. Jesus. 